gentlemen. Nice to see all the familiar faces again. So welcome again to this morning's um, Developing and Sustaining Nursing uh, Leadership in Community-Based Gerontological Care Symposium. Okay. And my name is Jasmine. Again, I'm the MC for this morning. So just a bit of housekeeping before we start the program proper, um, just to kindly ensure that our mobile phones are actually on silent mode or turned off for this morning's session. Okay. So um, I think you have seen some of the looping slides. Our program outlines are shared also on that slide there. Yeah. So to actually to start this morning, we will actually invite Kim Chu, our executive uh, chief executive director of South Foundation, to give us our welcome address. Kim Chu. Uh, uh, Professor Tara Cortez, uh, our distinguished panelists and friends and colleagues. Uh, as Jasmine has said, you know, I think uh, we see many familiar faces, so I reckon most of you would have been here yesterday morning as well. So for this morning, um, we, we're really discussing a very important topic, right? Developing and sustaining nursing leadership in community-based gerontological care. So, um, so I'm very glad you are here, and as we've mentioned yesterday, nurses play a very key role you know, in uh, developing community-based care. And, and really, if we look at the healthcare for future, the, you know, gerontological healthcare for the future, this is where it is, in the community. Yeah, and, and so how the, the role of the nurses, you know, uh, the development opportunities, the kind of training that uh, nurses need to have, we, we need to be supporting, providing, is, is very, very important. And um, so we, we're very happy here you know, that we, we, we can have this symposium, we can have Prof with us, and the panelists, as you can see uh, on, the, on the slide, that you know, are from the tertiary, edu the tertiary institutions, you know, from uh, services, practitioners, service providers, coming to discuss this very important topic. Um, so I don't want to say too much because I think yesterday I've already mentioned that, you know, what, what, what are the roles of the nurses within this community setup and uh, how, you know, I, I've described the nurse as a super nurse and I think rightly so because the nurse in the community needs to have a lot of skills and knowledge, you know, beyond the nursing skills and knowledge actually. So uh, I, without further ado, I'm not going to say more, I will leave Prof to pro give a lecture and then we can have that uh, panelist discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kim Chu. Okay, so now I'd like to in invite our keynote speaker, Professor Tara Cortez, Executive Director of the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing, to present her keynote presentation on developing and sustaining nursing leadership in community-based gerontological care. Professor. Thank you, Thank you Jasmine. Well, it is a pleasure to be here with you, Ms. Kim Chupe, and honored guest and panelist, and thank you so much for coming and, um, and being part of this, uh, this, this session. It's a very exciting time for me to be here. I, I've been saying to um, everyone I've met this week, you know, I, I've been here since Monday uh, working with the Sao Foundation, and I learned so much from all of you. It's, uh, I, I, I'm glad that I hopefully can bring some new information, new insights to you. But it's always, I always think of learning as circular and I have learned so much from all of you in this country and some of the wonderful work that you're doing. So I'm delighted to be here uh, to talk to you today about preparing nurses for the aging population because this is my passion. I, uh, we, we have, uh, the nursing workforce is I think the most influential part of the healthcare workforce and we have a lot of work to do. So the objectives for today's discussion are first of all, I'm going to spend just a moment, I think many of you might have been here yesterday, I'll spend a moment on changing global demographics with a little different perspective than we had yesterday. Describe the impact of aging on healthcare systems, identify the unique characteristics that are associated with aging, because they are so different, discuss the nurse competencies needed to lead quality care for older adults, describe some of the nurse-led models of community-based care, and also describe 
some of the work we do at the Hartford Institute in preparation of, to prepare the workforce to ensure geriatric specialized care. So the demographics. <clears throat> Globally, the rapid growth of people older than 65 is impacting economics, health care, and lifestyle. This is, of course, a global issue. I'm always fascinated as I travel to different countries and uh, listen to different people's perspectives. Some of the countries are calling aging the third stage instead of older adults. And I kind of like that. And I think, well, if we have the third stage, and that's healthy adults, maybe we have the fourth stage of people that are a little more frail, and maybe the fifth stage of people that are closer to end of life. So maybe we can describe aging as stages rather than calling people old or older. Uh, one of the things we steer away from at the Hartford Institute is we don't like the word elderly. Uh, it's an elderly person. Uh, it's an older person, it's a mature person is probably the way we like to address it better. Uh, in the U.S. today, one in six people is 65 or older. And in, for us in 2030, this will be one in five. So we'll hit 20% in 2030. In Singapore, one in seven people is 65 or older today. And in 2030, you will be one in four. And these are the demographics of the number of Singapore citizens age 65 and above. And you see the, the quick, the quick uh, growth uh, from 2005, where it was one in 11, one out of every 11, at, to one out of every four in 2030. So I think that shows you a very good visual of how that group of people that are older are, have fit within the population of Singapore. So this has a tremendous impact on the healthcare system. As people age, there is an increase in prevalence of chronic disease and frailty. In 2015, one in four Singaporeans older than 65 developed a chronic disease. In the same year, one in two, one in two were found at risk for chronic disease. People with chronic diseases drive up the health care costs and over time they become more frail and dependent. So chronic disease is a major, major piece of what we need to work with in this aging population. And then of course cognitive decline and depression are prevalent in any aging society. I maintain that depression is probably one of the most underdiagnosed situations in older adults. We don't recognize depression. Social isolation leads to depression. And sometimes just aging and a decreased loss in, in function makes people very depressed. The common chronic diseases in Singapore, um, to what I found in the literature, are asthma, COPD, heart disease, diabetes, which I understand is on the rise, and hypertension. And of course, when we look at hypertension, which is a, a major problem for many, many people, in the United States, 60% of people over the age of 65 have hypertension. Hypertension leads to a lot of other things, leads to cardiovascular disease, and leads to um, other problems. Diabetes, as I said, is on the uprise in, in Singapore and everywhere. Diabetes leads to almost everything. It leads to hypertension, it leads to eye disease, it leads to uh, kidney disease, and it leads to heart disease. So diabetes is one of those diseases that we really, really have to pay attention to, prevent it early on, and then when people do have it, then we must, must, must manage it. Some risk factors for any of these diseases are modifiable. An unhealthy diet can be modified through early on teaching, early on education of uh, children, as well as young adults. Physical inactivity, again, this becomes, all of these things become, be, are, are evident in our children. Inactivity, children today, so many of them are on their machines, so many of them are sitting in front of the television. We now have fast foods that are rampant around the world. Um, everybody's got the McDonald's and the Burger King and all of the Kentucky Fried Chicken. None of these are really healthy foods. You know, years ago, 
your grandparents and, and perhaps even your parents were eating more vegetables, more rice, more, it was a more of a, of a, of a uh, there weren't as many fried foods in the, in the diet. Uh, we need to pay attention to that and increase activity. Smoking. Smoking continues to be a problem in most societies, although there is so much evidence that smoking contributes to hypertension, to COPD, and to cancer. It is, um, and now we have e-cigarettes coming out that are flavored and attractive to the teenagers, and um, these are all problems in terms of the development of chronic diseases later on in life. So we have a great disparity between the workforce, the community, and the needs. The workforce has been educated to care for people with acute conditions. Nurses, doctors, social workers, physical therapists are all trained hospital-based. Hospitals have been the center of health care. Workforce is prepared to care for sick people. We have found that social determinants of health, such as food, transportation, housing, and education, affect health. Any care planning, anywhere it's done, whether you are planning a person's, you're working to develop a plan of care for someone who's in the hospital and they're transitioning back to the community or they're in primary care, needs to incorporate these factors into the plan of care. If someone's housing is inadequate, if you're sending an older person home to a house that has many steps, if the person has lost some of their mobility and the bathroom has no grab bars, you're sending them into, a, into an environment that is very dangerous. If you're sending them into a place and expecting them to get back to see the doctor on their own and they don't have access to transportation, you're sending them to a situation where they cannot have access to the necessary health care that they need. Health literacy empowers people to self-manage chronic disease and promote health. I think this is a new frontier for all healthcare workers to be educating people and figuring out innovative ways to provide that information to the general population about things like inactivity, stress management, um, nutrition, the right kinds of diets. We have to help people have this knowledge so they're empowered to care for themselves. There simply aren't enough resources to meet the needs of the aging population if we don't think differently about health care. We need to keep people at their highest level of wellness. We need to keep them out of the hospitals. We need to keep them out of nursing homes. We need to keep them functioning independently as long as possible. So the gerontological nursing workforce, what is needed here and what is what is geriatric nursing well older adults require unique health care I've said this I, those of you who were here yesterday I said it probably several times caring for an 80 year old is not like caring for a 40 or 50 year old a, a, a heart attack or an MI in an 80 year old is not like an MI in a 45 or 50 year old not that it's any less important but they're at a different stage of life so their entire environment is different. Geriatric nurses know that adults, older adults, have atypical responses to many diseases and illnesses. Just take the myocardial infarction, for example. An older person may not at all have the signs and symptoms of chest pain or, um, or, or arm pain. They may have a little shortness of breath. They may have what feels like discomfort in the abdomen but it may be very different signs. Nurse, geriatric nurses know this. The workforce has been educated to cure disease, not prevent it. Geriatric nurses know to encourage behaviors that enhance healthy aging and encourage high mental and physical function. It is part of their knowledge base. It is part of what they do. The workforce is educated to develop and drive the plan of care independent of the uniqueness of the individual and their environment. Geriatric nurses understand that older people are more complex and age very differently, a lot of it depending on the chronic diseases they have, their life experiences, and genetics. 
They also, geriatric nurses, allow older people to make informed decisions on how they live and die. And this is person-centered care. So the geriatric nurse knows that the person is part of the team and part of the development of any care plan. And they need to take their, their wishes into consideration. The workforce is educated to be hospital-centric, negating the influence of anything else related to health and wellness. Well, most older adults don't live in the hospital. In fact, they don't, no one lives in the hospital. Some might live in long-term care. The majority of older adults live in the community. That is where geriatric nursing is most utilized and most important. Geriatric nurses know to assist older adults in self-management of chronic disease so they can stay in the community, age in place. The workforce is prepared to care for children and adults. No distinction, children and adults. Caring for people in the last third of their life is not the same as caring for people in the first or second stage of their life. Geriatric nurses understand the differences between caring for children caring for adults, and caring for older adults. And I'm always struck by the fact that we all have pediatrics in our training. Whether you, whatever, whatever profession you're in, you have pediatrics. We don't have geriatrics. And we have, just look at your population here, you have far more people that are geriatrics than you do that are pediatrics. And yet we have a whole, a whole curriculum around pediatrics. So what are the workforce issues uh, for this changing uh, environment? Well, we have a shortfall of health care providers with any knowledge for caring for older adults. In the United States, we have three, a little more than three million nurses. Of those nurses, uh, less than 1% are certified in geriatric nursing. We have only 7,000 geriatricians in the United States, and frankly, as our number of geriatric patients or people is increasing, the number of geriatricians is decreasing. A lot of it is money driven. Geriatricians don't make as much money as a surgeon does or as a radiologist does. So a lot of it is money related. There is um, uniquely, uh, there, there are, to deal with, the, um, with this are unique and costly needs of the growing older population. People with chronic diseases consume more of the health care resources than anyone else. We know that in the United States, people with chronic diseases, four, three or four chronic diseases, consume 80% of the health care resources. So the older population is consuming far more of the resources than are the younger population. And of course, we do have an increasing number of chronic conditions as people age. The second point here is very important. Healthcare workers must practice to the full scope of their profession. And I would ask you all, all of the nurses in the audience, to think about what you do in your practice and are you practicing to the full scope of your license? Does your environment allow you to practice to the full scope of license? And because some of it is I, in primary care, for example, I know that in the States, most primary care practices, nurses are doing triage. They're, they're, they're ta and it's very different to do triage in primary care than it is in an emergency room. This is not, you know, oh, here, you, just, you need a, an injection, so you'll, you just wait there, and you'll, uh, you've, you're having your annual physical. So it's managing the schedule. That is not what a nurse should be doing in primary care. They don't manage a schedule. They should be involved in health promotion, chronic disease management, and prevention of disease. Person and family-centered interdisciplinary team care has been the hallmark of geriatrics. Uh, 1998, I think it was, the, um, through the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing and New York University, geriatric interdisciplinary team training was introduced. It's called the GIT program, G-I-T-T -T program. And it was all about interdisciplinary team care for older patients. We developed ACE units in hospitals, acute care of the elderly units in hospitals, all team-based so that the whole team was involved in patient care. 
we now have moved the GIT program into the community so that it can be part of primary care, home care, long-term care. But it is about team care. And very often it is a nurse-led team because the nurse is the person who is most involved with the connection of that patient to all parts of the healthcare system. So I maintain that a nurse-led team can also be, have circular leadership because there are times in a patient's continuum of health that other professions need to kick in and be the leader of the team. So there may be a time when the physician becomes the leader of that team because the patient has an acute onset of a, of a health issue. There can be a time when a social worker is the leader of the team because the patient has a financial issue, can't buy their medications, is scrimping on food because they don't have enough money and the social worker comes in to help that. So that whole idea of the interprofessional team is so important when you are looking at, at the uh, leadership and the roles of people on the team. And, um, but the nurse is still the one who connects and determines who needs to kick in at any particular time. So what does interprofessional collaboration mean? Well, first of all, you have to have the value and ethics for interprofessional practice. It's based on person-centered care with a population or a community orientation. It's a sense of shared purpose and commitment. I would also say it is mutual respect for each member of the team. It's respecting what each person brings to the table. And too often we have people sitting around the table that we think, well, they're not really important in this. Maybe it's the occupational therapist. Maybe it's the patient themselves. Maybe it's the, the person's family. Maybe, and very often, it is the, the caretaker in the home, the home health aide, the direct care workforce. And I am here to say that they are probably, they are the eyes and the ears of a, of a patient. And I've had direct caregivers, the home health aides, say to me, you know, I, I can't call the doctor if something happens to the patient. They won't talk to me. They want to hear from the family. Well, you know, the family is 3,000 miles away. The direct caregiver is with the patient 24 hours a day. They know the patient best. You must learn to respect whoever is having contact with that patient listen to them, be open to what their perception is what's happening. The second aspect of interprofessional collaboration has to do with understanding the roles and responsibilities of other people. If you don't know the role of the social worker in the interdisciplinary team, how do you use them? If you don't know the role or the reason for an occupational therapist, how do you use them? Interprofessional communication is the basic core of interprofessional collaboration. Unless you know how to communicate with one another, unless you know how to report um, symptoms, assessment, what your responsibilities are, you, you're losing some of the most important aspects of communication. So if you're talking to the doctor, you're assessing a patient, you're basically going to look at, you, you use SBAR as probably the most common one. What are the symptoms? What are the behaviors I see? What is my assessment? And what is the response? So if you, unless you can articulate in some manner to the next care provider, you're basically not going to be understood and listened to. So you have to be sure that you're articulate and you're communicating important information. And teams and teamwork, learning to be a good team player. For those of you who were here yesterday, you saw, saw a slide perhaps where I had a person being held up by many, many people. It's being a team player. You know, if you're playing soccer, you know, World Cup is on now. If you're playing soccer, every single person on that team is important. It's not all about me, that I'm the only one who can put the ball in the net. Unless I pass and let other people help me get that ball in the net, the team is going to lose. Team care around patients is exactly the same. You need to know and be able to pass the, the baton, as um, one of our panelists said yesterday, passing the baton to a different team in transitional care, but passing the, top, the baton to another member of the team 
when you are a team caring for a patient in the community or in the hospital or in long-term care. So the nurse is a leader. Let's just take this for a moment. It's important that all nurses are trained as leaders, not just advanced practice nurses or administrators. How many of you sitting here in the audience today perceive yourselves as a leader? Hands high, hands high. Wow. Every one of you is a leader. Every one of you are leading patient care. Anytime you touch a patient, influence a patient, you are leading patient care and you have to believe that. That has to be part of you. Every nurse is a leader of patient care. Patient, being a leader isn't about, oh, I'm a director or I'm a manager. It's not a title. And I don't, you may be the best IC, ICU nurse that there is. You may be able to, you know, run the, put in the draw bloods and put in um, medications into all different kinds of, of bags that are going into the patient and get that patient stabilized. Beca being skilled does not make you a leader. A leader is not how to do, it's how to be. It's who you are inside and how you perceive yourself. I am a nurse and be proud of it. Be proud of who you are and see yourself as the most important person at the table because you are the hub to help that patient navigate the healthcare system and get the appropriate care, the right care at the right time in the right place. So what are the skills that are needed to lead a team? Well, first of all, you do need to have the depth and breadth of knowledge. To be a leader, you do have to have knowledge. So I maintain for the topics we're talking about today, which are geriatrics and community-based care, you need to have knowledge in geriatrics and knowledge in community-based care. Community-based care is really, again, how do you promote wellness, maintain function, physical and cognitive function, and manage chronic disease. That's the core. You need to have a common goal for your team. If you are leading, if you're the nurse of a team that's giving care to a patient in the community or in the hospital or in long-term care, what is the goal of the team? The goal of the team really is around what is the goal of the patient? Where do you want to get that patient? The focus is always on the patient outcomes. The focus is not on, oh, well, I want to make sure that by the end of the day that um, I have, I've, I've got the, 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 the bandage um, appropriately placed on the patient and I've got them comfortable in bed. That's not an outcome. That's your tasks that you're doing. The outcome should be patient focused. The outcome is, is, the, is, the, is the wound healing that in a week, there is, a, a, there is progression in uh, the granulation of, of, of tissue around a particular wound that the patient has. It's something you can observe, something you can measure. Those are, those are what your goals are. Also within a team, you have to cultivate trust. And trust is cultivated by honesty. Don't ever say you know something when you don't. It's much better to say, and I, I do it all the time, I, a student will ask me something, a, a patient will ask me something. I don't, I'm not a walking encyclopedia. I don't, I'm not a Google. <laughs> I don't know everything. I don't know, and I say I don't know, but I will find out. So if you don't know something, don't try to think, oh, well, I have to say I know it because they're gonna think I'm, I'm not too smart. The smart person says I don't know it, but I will find out. You need to know the roles, I said this before, of everyone on the team. That's an important piece so that you can respect everybody in the team. If you don't know what they do, you, don't, you can't respect them. And I said, I talked about effective communication, meaningful communication that actually portrays, you know, you've seen those pictures of, of somebody talking to somebody and somebody not listening and, and repeating something that's not relevant. It, Communication involves speaking, but it also involves listening, so that you are listening as well to make for effective communication. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, mutual respect. You cultivate respect amongst the team. 
So the key principles of nurse-led gerontological care, this is what we try to do for older people. This is the, the heart of gerontological care. Promote healthy lifestyle and maintenance of function. Promote confidence in self-care and self-esteem. So you have to help the person con develop confidence. That's through that education, health literacy. Develop confidence in their own ability to manage their disease. And if somebody, somebody's um, hemoglobin A1C goes way up because of something that's happened, you don't take them and blame them for something. You try to understand what happened and then help them to understand what behavior needs to change. Preserve the dignity and quality of life, and this certainly goes all the way through the end of life care. And I, if you were here yesterday, you heard me talk about maintaining people at home, not sending to the hospital in the last days of life. Dignity, it, they're, they're, dying in the hospital is not a dignified way to die. And although families often say, send them to the hospital because you think you're going to, they're going to survive because you get them to the hospital. And they're put into a situation, an environment that is foreign to them. Many times their family members can't all be there at the same time. They've got lights on, they've got sound going on. Uh, it's not a dignified way to die. So pre preserve dignity and quality of life all the way through. And I, I'm sure none of you do this, I'm sure. Uh, you, older people don't, they shouldn't be called honey and uh, baby. And uh, those are all demeaning. This, this is not a person who has returned to an infantile state. This is a person who has increased in complexity throughout the lifespan. Their, their circle has become bigger and bigger with all their experiences. This is a very complex human being who needs to be treated with respect and dignity. The gerontological nursing nurses can describe age-related changes in each body system. We all change as we age. Skin changes, our, every one of our, of our systems changes. We need to understand what those changes are, what is normal and what's not normal. You know, people will say, oh, losing your sight is a normal part of aging. It is not. Losing your hearing is a normal part of aging. It is not. Sometimes people just have wax in their ears and it needs to be cleaned out. Macular degeneration is a very, very important um, aspect of vision loss. And people need to be watching it if they have macular degeneration because if they have dry, they can progress. But it can have a bleed in a moment. It needs to be watched because they may not know if they have a bleed and then they lose their vision. Glaucoma needs to be watched. So vision loss isn't normal, needs to be watched. Um, recognize that atypical presentation of illness is common. Urinary tract infections for me is the most, is the most typical one. No way to, would, it, you don't have all the normal things. The, the person's urine may not be smelly, but the person may have delirium. And then you say, well, oh, this person is, they've got, their dementia is much worse. You need to look for an infection when somebody has delirium. You need to see, there's usually an underlying cause for it. And a urinary, a urine culture would be an automatic thing to do just to be sure that they don't have a urinary tract infection. Identify early signs of illness to prevent hospitalization. Pneumonia, identify it early before it gets to the point where the person has, is really debilitated from pneumonia. See if you can't keep the patient at home. You want to identify symptoms early so that you don't send the patient to the hospital because then the patient's going to lose function, they're, they're going to increase frailty because they're in the hospital. Keep them at home. Collaborate with interprofessional team members to promote comprehensive care and prevent transitional care issues. So transitional care and keeping people at home requires collaboration with the team. If there's no communication on discharge, meaningful communication on discharge to the next place of where the person is going, whether it be home, whether it be a community hospital for rehab, or whether it be long-term care. If communication is inadequate, that person is going to end up going right back to the hospital. So good communication across the transition and with the team members that are pertinent is essential. 
So what are some community-based nurse-led models of care? Well, one of, I think, the most um, uh, Im important one, and, and I think probably the, the I hate to put a value on, but I think this is a pretty good program, and this is the PACE program, and I think you call it EPIC. I think you do a type of a PACE program here that is called EPIC. This is a wonderful way to keep people at home and out of the hospital and out of nursing homes. It provides daycare through a senior center for a person. It has an interprofessional team that actually is involved with the patient's care, so you're getting team-based care with all of the pieces that you need, including dental, including foot care, including um, occupational or physical therapy. There, so there is care coordination regardless of where you go because this, this team is responsible for you whether you're in the hospital, whether you're in the home, whether you're in the community hospital. And it's comprehensive. It provides care to people wherever they are. So what is the role of the nurse in a PACE program? The role of the nurse is very important. The, the nurse is ensuring that the patient and the family are setting their own goals. So again, the nurse has the responsibility to advocate. The nurse is the patient's biggest advocate. So the nurse is advocating for them to direct their care, not for the physician or someone else to direct their care. So the goals are set. The nurse is assuring that the patient's empowered to do their goals. The nurse is really the coordinator. The nurse coordinates transitional care, referrals to any specialist or anything that the person needs while they're in the, um, in the PACE program. And they facilitate team-based communication because that's, remember, that's what the nurse, the gerontological nurse does. The nurse facilitates excellent communication. If you go back to those principles I had for gerontological nursing. Primary care. Well, primary care, what is, the, what is it about? It's about health promotion and chronic disease management and specialist referral. That's what primary care should be. Patients don't go for primary care care normally, they, they do go if they have an acute, if they have an onset of a bad cold or they have something going on for a referral to a specialist. But the bottom line is for primary care is that it's, you want to keep the patient at the highest level of function, cognitively and physically, and manage their chronic disease. A gap in primary care is insufficient utilization of community-based services. I feel very strongly that primary care should not begin and end with a visit to the primary care office. That the primary care provider or the team, the nurse in that primary care clinic, needs to be very involved in finding appropriate resources in the community for, for person referral. Be it nutrition, be it um, social, maybe the person has social isolation, finding a place for a senior center for the person to go, a community center for the person to be involved in. The nurse needs to know the community, understand the community, and know where to refer the patient. What is the role of the nurse then? Well, the role of the nurse is care coordination with the community resources, with the specialist, with referrals. So the nurse is basically coordinating the care so that patient has all of the right care at the right time. Per, the nurse also uh, ensures and advocates for the patient to have person-directed care. And again, communication. Facilitates communication amongst the team members. Home-based care. What are the key elements of home-based care? It could be short-term or long-term. If someone doesn't go to a community hospital and goes home, they may have short-term home care. Or a person may be, a, may be in the need for long-term care and have long-term care over a period of time. The key people, the key elements in it are professionals, nurses, doctors, social workers, maybe a physical therapist, occupational therapist, the direct caregiver and the family caregiver. And again, I say the direct caregiver and family caregiver are key key members of that team. And it is referral for services. The team brings one element, but are there other things the patient needs and they need to refer for services. So what is the role of the nurse? Well, the nurse is the, is the there's direct leadership by the nurse of the home health team. So the direct leadership by the nurse for the patient, the family, the caregiver, and anyone else who's seeing the patient. 
The nurse knows when to call the doctor in. The nurse knows when to call the social worker in. The nurse knows when to turn over the leadership to the social worker or to the physical or to the physician or the physical therapist. The nurse is again communication, communicates between the family and the medical provider, is the liaison. Leads conflict resolution and decision making with the patient, family, and caregiver. This is often a very big issue and I know I've seen it in some of the home visits I've done. Conflict resolution. So the nurse needs to, when we talk about what leadership skills does the nurse need, the nurse needs conflict resolution skills. How do you resolve conflict when the caregiver and the patient's family and the patient are not on the same page? So it is a skill that nurses need. Long-term care, nursing homes. The key element here is promotion of functional independence. Even if the person is in long-term care, you want to keep them functional as long as possible. You want to keep people from being bedridden as long as possible. Again, person, we call it resident-directed care in the United States. If someone is a resident of a nursing home, we call it resident-directed care. And I, I, I know as short as seven years ago, eight years ago, talking to a nursing home um, administrator and talking about, well, person-directed care, well, Tara, what does that mean? And I said, well, they need, if, if they have their whole life not gotten up from, uh, until 10 o'clock in the morning and had breakfast at 10 o'clock, well, then that's what they should be able to, oh, you can't possibly do that. You can't individualize care. Well, we have now moved through most of our nursing homes into person-centered care. So if a person really doesn't get up until 10 o'clock, why are we going to wake them up at 7 and force breakfast down them, which they're not going to eat, and then have them lethargic until 10 o'clock in the morning? It's not good care. That's what person-centered care is, that the person can set their day, they can, they can do their day, and we just have to make it happen. And through good leadership, good coordination, you can do that. Um, we have a variety of services in long-term care. There should be physical therapy available. There should be occupational therapy available for people to keep, keep their, their hands moving. Um, maximize the quality of life. And it often, you often have an extended peri period of care. You know, we can have people with dementia linger on for years and years. So oftentimes people are in long-term care for a very long time. Uh, the role of the nurse is, again, leading the team of caregivers. That is the role of the nurse. And we don't have enough registered nurses in long-term care anywhere. I don't think anywhere in the world do we have enough nurses in long-term care. We need to promote nurses coming into long-term care. We need that kind of leadership in long-term care. Again, they're the liaison between the medical provider and the patient, the communicator. And they guide person, family-centered care, particularly in the choice of the level of care. And when I talk about level of care in long-term care, I'm talking about the intensity. When is it time to say enough is enough? And, and let the patient, put the patient on palliative care, let them be comfortable, and let them um, move forward in, in, in their journey of life. In other words, don't send them to the hospital to go into the ICU. Uh, community-based organizations. What, what is the role of the nurse in a, in a community-based organization? Well, the key elements there are really to enhance social determinants of health, such as nutrition, transportation, social services, education. So it's a real partnership in community-based organizations between the nurse and the social worker, where primary care is, pro the primary partners in that are the nurse and the physician, with the social worker available. Here it's the nurse and the social worker with the primary care provider also part of the team. So it's coordinating referrals for patients needing services. So if a person is in your senior center and, or your com community-based organization and um, they are a caregiver for somebody, their husband has dementia and they're at risk of caregiver burden and stress, you refer the patient to a caregiver uh, support group. And I think one of the biggest issues, the biggest opportunities for nursing in community-based organizations, senior centers, is increasing health literacy through population health education. And I spoke yesterday briefly on our developing a volunteer grassroots team of trainer, trained by nurses, to go out and teach seniors 
and change their behaviors, give them opportunities, give them the resources and the knowledge they need to improve their care, improve their health. So we've highlighted some of the major issues impacting the health of our aging population. It's the quickly growing number of people over 65. It's the increasing longevity of people today. I think your average age, I think I heard yesterday, 82. Is that about right? 86 for women, 82 for men. And I think the, um, the Minister of Health said yesterday, that's increasing. Expect that to increase. And that number is increasing pretty, in all the developed countries it's increasing. And it's due to better medications, better treatments, better diagnostic um, opportunities. You know, cancer is no longer a fatal disease. Cancer is a chronic disease now. So we've, we've made so many advances. Uh, the unique health care needs of older adults is another issue that impacts that we're not, this, the older people are not the same as younger ones. And the unique knowledge and skills required to provide health care to older adults. So we've discussed models of care to improve the life and health of older adults in the community. But what resources and knowledge do nurses need to effectively lead health care teams and decrease the incidence and impact of chronic disease and ensure that older adults have the unique health care necessary for quality of life? So that's the, the, you want to lead a team, nurses lead teams, to decrease the incidence and the impact of chronic disease and ensure older adults have the health care they need access to health care for quality of life. Preparing a gerontological nursing workforce is essential if we're to provide the right care at the right time in the right place to older adults. And I've said before about the expertise, you need to have the depth and breadth of knowledge to provide that unique care that is necessary for care of the older. So it's skills and knowledge to lead those interprofessional teams Skill and, ger skill and knowledge in gerontological nursing, skill and knowledge in interprofessional practice, skill and knowledge in leading. The literature shows, and this is, uh, this is where I think nursing education and nursing practice need to do a lot of work. Literature shows that the more knowledge students have about a particular area, the more comfortable they are in that area. What we have found is that in the United States, in our systems, our nurses are still, for the most part, prepared for hospital-based nursing. So why would they go into a community setting? They're not comfortable. They don't have the knowledge. They weren't in community. They didn't have a whole curriculum on community-based care, on health promotion and disease, chronic disease management. They were really grounded in the hospital. They don't have a lot of information or, and, and, and experience in long-term care and working in a nursing home. They're still afraid of older people. Older people are, are kind of like they don't know what to do with them. So unless they have that opportunity to become familiar with that environment, they will not be going into those kinds of environments. The timeline for preparation is what I think, we've got our basic education is your milestone one. Advanced preparation is your milestone two. Certification, specialization is your milestone three. And certainly milestone four for every professional is continuing education. New learning and education is a lifelong journey. This is not a sprint. Your career is a long time marathon. You will move through it, but unless you get new information, because information changes every single day, and unless you are open and seeking new knowledge, you won't enjoy what you're doing. So that continuing education piece is so important if you are going to continue to be an enthusiastic, satisfied healthcare provider. So what should be in every basic education course. Well, I think it's essential that gerontology is an integral part of every basic nursing course. Should it be an integrated or a freestanding course? You know, I often think when we integrate something in, we integrate it out. So if we say this course, this is my adult, adult nursing course, and oh yes, we teach gerontology. 
Well, if I happen to be an instructor, if I were teaching the course, we'd have a lot of gerontology in it. But that's because that's my specialization. If you have a, a professor who doesn't really, who's, who's really um, skill and, and knowledge is in acute care of, uh, of adults, ICU and, and medical nursing, surgical nursing, uh, it's going to be less on geriatrics and more on acute care of older adults. So I, I think that pulling things out into a separate course, this is my bias, everyone doesn't agree with me, so I'll put that right out there, it's my bias. But I think having a separate course allows you to put the attention on that particular content. We have a pediatrics course. We don't integrate pediatrics throughout the curriculum. Why not have a separate um, uh, a geriatric course? Um, so this course needs to provide the content on the health care of older adults, where they are located, and what their goals are. Are they in the hospital? Are they home? or are they in long-term care? Because we see them in all those places. Are they very well? Are they frail? Are they on palliative care, hospice care, or are they at the very end of life? All of those require different skill sets, different knowledge bases, different goals for the patient. The sample content for entry to practice degree is basically the nurse has to understand the physiological changes in aging, they need to know how to promote wellness behaviors in older adults, things such as nutrition, exercise, stress management, sexuality, spirituality, socialization. What are the needs of older adults? Patho they need to know the pathophysiology associated with chronic disease. What happens when someone has diabetes at the age of 50? What does it look like when they're 80, if it's managed well? How do we identify atypical presentations of illness? What does it mean in older adults? How do you know that person is ill or not? Chronic pain management is a big deal for older adults. And you know, you have TCM here, and I think um, that I, I was just talking to someone yesterday about the complementarity of, of that with the traditional, um, with the, or the Western medicine. Because uh, chronic disease management and the use of um, opioids right now in the United States is a huge problem. A lot of our older adults are addicted to pain medication because they have chronic pain. And at one time, no one realized opioids were addictive. So that was the treatment of choice. So it is um, chronic pain management is a big deal for older adults as joints deteriorate um, and other parts of the body become um, painful. Ma management of polypharmacy, well certainly poly uh, polypharmacy is a major problem with older adults. I think you probably do know the BEERS criteria, B-E-E-R-S. Uh, that's, uh, that's really a bible for um, nurses dealing with older adults and their medications because their cross um, uh, inter interactions between medications is so common in older adults and we don't even realize the patient is so tired well, they're, if they're so tired, they're at a fall risk. They also not, don't have a quality of life. What's going on with their medications? Do their medications need to be changed? And sometimes we put somebody on a medication and they stay on that medication for many, 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 many years. They may not need to be on it. Um, the three Ds, depression, dementia, delirium. Big issues for older adults. We know dementia, one out of two people, 85 and over, develop dementia. Not always Alzheimer's disease, dementia. So it is an issue, and when we have delirium superimposed on dementia, we have a real crisis to deal with. And again, I said depression is, um, is a factor. Caregiver needs, caregiver burden uh, is something that nurses need to know about. We, we, have, we, we provide in the states $40 billion worth of free care is given by family caregivers every year. They come out of the workforce to take care of their husband, their wife, their mother, their father, even a child sometimes. It is, we need to think about the caregivers because they are stressed. And leadership, leadership should be part of every entry to practice degree program. In um, 2010, the heart, what happened? Oh, there it is. I, I, I got it. Uh, 
In 2010, the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing at the NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing, which I head up the Hartford Institute, we collaborated with the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, oh, thank you, to develop 19 competencies for geriatric nursing practice. Now, we worked yesterday afternoon with some nursing competencies. This is 19, I think we had less, but um, it, is, it's, it provides, though, rationale, suggestions for content, teaching strategies, and resources for um, the curriculum in undergraduate programs. It guides the faculty in preparing students who are competent in caring for older adults and their family. Fabian? <laughs> it's not moving. Thank you. Then we have um, certification for registered nurses. The American Nurses Credentialing Center, known as ANCC, is a subsidiary of the American Nurses Association. They have specialty certification in 18 different areas, including gerontological nursing for nurses who have completed their baccalaureate degree. To be eligible, it's a current active license in the U.S. or, and I bring this to your attention, or the professional legally recognized equivalent in another country. So people in Singapore who have a baccalaureate degree are eligible for certification. You have to practice two years full time as a nurse. You have to have a minimum of 2,000 hours of clinical practice in geriatrics in the last three years. Well, anyone who works in healthcare we have so many older adults that obviously, no matter where you're located, unless you're in pediatrics or uh, OB, obstetrics, you've, you're working with older people. I've had 30 hours of continuing education in gerontological nursing in the past three years. And there is the website to it, um, to the site. There's a comprehensive test required for specialty certification. So if you've met the eligibility, you take a test. The exam is offered by ANCC. And the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing has a comprehensive review course. It's a 15-hour course that is online to help nurses prepare for the um, ANCC certification exam. And the online course is a general course in geriatrics. It follows the blueprint for the test, but it also, some nurses take it just to know more about geriatrics. So what does advanced preparation look like um, in the United States? What's advanced practice nursing in the United States? Well, under the APRN, Advanced Practice Registered Nurse Regulatory Model, they must be educated, certified, and licensed in a particular role and a particular population. So adult gerontological nurse, gerontology nurse practitioners are educated across the wellness and illness continuum for either acute or primary care. So they're educated to work in one or the other. The scope of practice for these two different certifications doesn't depend on the setting. It's the difference between the patient care needs of primary care or acute care. It doesn't matter where you're doing it. It's the difference of the needs of the patient. The degree of wellness care and chronic disease management done by an acute care NP is different from that done by the primary care NP. Practice models are based then on the local needs of patients and the availability of physicians and nurse practitioners. In primary, in New York, for example, in New York City, the primary care NP would practice very differently when, than would the primary care NP in the uh, Indian tribes in North Dakota. There are no physicians in North Dakota. There are no physicians in the frontier areas. They might visit one time a, a week or one time a month. So in our rural and frontier areas, nurse practitioners, or particularly the frontier areas, nurse practitioners have far more to do uh, in terms of autonomy. In the big cities where you have much more access to health care, the uh, needs are a little different. So the primary care nurse practitioner may be in a specialty hypertension clinic or in a primary care practice where they manage their own patients. In acute care, the NP might be on a high volume surgical specialty service, managing inpatients and outpatients all day and provide 24 hour coverage because the surgeon is in the operating room. So in acute care, the nurse practitioner practices much more as a 
resident, a medical resident or a medical intern under the supervision of the physician. In primary care, they're far more autonomous in carrying their own load. So I, this is hard to see. I, I could only do it as a photo from um, the book, but it, it basically shows you all of the APRN roles, and we have the nurse anesthetist, the nurse midwife, the clinical nurse specialist, and the nurse practitioner. And those roles go into a population focus, such as adult gerontology, um, the family nurse practitioner, the neonatal nurse practitioner, pediatric, women's health, and psych mental health. And then on top of that, we, some, we try to give them greater specialization. We at the Hartford Institute feel that as we do, as we are preparing people for adult geriatrics, adults and gerontology, we could give them a little extra on the unique of, of older adults, both at the wellness, well older adults and frail older adults. So we've developed a program to do this. The advanced practice competencies are, uh, we again, the Hartford Institute worked with the American Association of Colleges of Nursing to come out with the competencies for the acute care nurse practitioner in 2012 and for the primary care nurse practitioner in 2010. I just had a conversation with um, the AACN a month ago. I said, do these need to be updated at all? Because, you know, they're eight years old and six years old. So to me, they seemed a little old. And they said, no, we're, we're there still. They said, they're as relevant today as they were. So I said, all right, let us know when, when you're ready to redo them, um, and we'll be happy to work with you on them. So these are still considered the, um, the competencies. So the core knowledge for the NP is the three Ps, pharmacology, physical assessment, and pathophysiology. This is different than the basic preparation for the RN. The critical thinking is, again, at an advanced level, bringing in the pharmacology, the physical assessment, the pathophysiology, with comprehensive assessment skills, accurate medical diagnosis, not a nursing diagnosis, a medical diagnosis, evidence-based care, how do we use technology in healthcare, they know that, leadership, 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 and certainly ethics and law, because they are practicing at a higher level and um, Legal, legally and ethically, they, they are held to another standard. So the Hartford Institute um, has an online program that can be offered to advanced practice nurses by universities. I am not going to go into depth on this, but it's a program that, oh, time up. Okay, I'll go fast. I will, um, the, uh, uh, the, this program, we're looking to make this more as just modules that are online to, for advanced practice nurses. So I'm going through very, I'm going to go really rapidly. These are some of the resources that are available online for the Hartford Institute. So you can access them online, but we have, and I think I, I was asked if my slides could be disseminated. Yes, my slides could be disseminated, so much of this you can look at. Uh, but we have case studies for geriatric nursing practice. We have ebooks available through the Apple Store, and I couldn't access them here. I don't know if it's because I'm in Singapore. I don't know. But I've asked my office staff to find out why I can't put IPEP into my app, into my app store and find the iPep books. They're for free. There are six books, six mini books on, and these are the topics it covers on interprofessional responsibilities in healthcare team settings. It's really focused on community care, not on hospitals. Um, we have virtual patient case studies online. We have um, teaching and nursing home programs to help faculty figure out how to teach nurses in nursing homes and what some of the priorities are. Um, these are the topics, which you can look at the slides and see them. We have a Gero Psychiatric Nursing Initiative, which has eight modules in it to uh, help uh, nurses understand the Gero Psych issues of uh, geriatrics. Uh, our GNEC curriculum was designed in collaboration with the AACN to provide faculty with essential knowledge to help guide introduction of geriatric content. These are the topics. Try this series. If you don't know Try This Series, you should. It's, it's, it's for free. You go on it, and it, has, it is a wonderful, wonderful reference for assessment tools. 
it, it's just a, each one is a two-page document, one with what the tool does, and the other side is the tool. We have 34 in general assessment, six in specialty practice series, 12 in the dementia series, and three in the quality improvement series. We try to update them at least every three years, and I think most of them now are up to date. Geriatric nurses are not born, they are made. And it is all of the content we talked about today, but it's also from here. It's your heart. It's your heart because you embrace with passion the care of older adults. You understand their uniqueness and value they bring, and you want to have the passion to care for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that. And now we'd like to invite uh, Yok Hyung, our Assistant Director of Nursing, to do her presentation um, on... Sorry, I missed the title here. I think the title's not here. Okay, she's going to set the stage for the panel discussion. Uh, shortly after her presentation, we'll have the panel discussion this morning. Um, very shortly, uh, I've just shared some slides with you all to actually kind of get a bit of the uh, uh, the scene in Singapore uh, pertaining to community Geron nursing and also wanted to discuss more on actually uh, nursing leadership. So when, when one age in uh, Singapore, these are some of the challenges I thought you know, of uh, being old in Singapore. Because uh, as I think yesterday to today, we have been talking about a lot of chronic diseases that are actually uh, affecting an older person. And in Singapore, healthcare costs, not only the audience here, the older persons are in the frame of mind. How much does it cost, you know, if I'm admitted? How much of the CPF can be deducted? The family be worried about actually their healthcare costs. Over the healthcare system, nowadays there are so many changes in the healthcare system, they are lost. Barrier to communication, speaking in dialects for the, uh, the uh, older persons in Singapore, there are many dialects and does our healthcare workers really are able to communicate with them in dialects? And health education in dialects, is it heard of? And burdens, being a burden to the family, is always um, something that worries them they do not want to be a burden, but with their frailty, they just sigh and be helpless. Smaller families in Singapore and the generation gaps about even with their grandchildren speaking in not dialects can be actually a barrier and adding stress to the intergeneration uh, solidarity. And caregiver stress, as Prof has said, is also due to the family getting smaller. There are actually a lot of caregiver stress. Losses in their lives, loneliness, depression, and even sometimes to the point of suicide. These are actually some of the challenges meeting, facing older people in Singapore, and it could be for other countries as well. With this in mind, then we think about what the nurses can do you know, to support older persons to live a fruitful and healthy life. In, um, this is actually uh, Mr. Gan Kin Yong in his speech uh, talk, talking about we need actually 30,000 more healthcare workers needed by 2020 to cater for Singapore's aging populations. So in his speech, and then he mentioned, you know, the key, the center of gravity now is actually moving away from hospital to community. And he added that, um, there is a strong emphasis to develop community nursing as the options for this present stage to actually uh, to care for the aging populations. So looking at the, uh, this is just old statistics from uh, the annual report obtained from Singapore Nursing Board that the causes, because looking at the challenges and looking at the demand, and then what are the trainings that has taken place to provide the theoretical and uh, knowledge for uh, training nurses. And to date, uh, there is the, from the um, Nian Polytechnic, there's uh, our course collaborations with Nian Polytechnic, is the Specialist Diploma in Community Geron Nursing. There's also the, uh, with uh, Nian also has a Specialist Diploma in Clinical Educations. 
There's also the uh, specialist diploma in nursing gerontology by NYP. There's also actually uh, an advanced diploma in actually uh, gerontology has been run by uh, Nian Polytechnic for a good number of years, more than 10 years. And then I think uh, adding to this new uh, number of causes are the recent uh, course uh, by, uh, developed by uh, NUS in a full graduate diploma in community health nursing program. And this is also done in a part-time basis. So with all these uh, institutions, you know, supporting uh, uh, the training of nurses, then we also look at uh, some of the, um, because there's always say that, you know, they wanted the APNs to be actually the cream of the crops, to be the nursing leaders. But as Prof say, everybody's a leader. But I just want to highlight, this is the slide that I'm able to obtain only. So I'm actually just going to actually highlight that uh, in the advanced practice nurses in Singapore, the certi those that are certified, in the acute hospital, if you actually uh, look at the, um, the, top, the top one on uh, acute care, in 20, uh, 2016, there are 30 at the right at the corner there. There are 30 in acute care, 121 in actually medical surgical nursing, mental health, there are 27. And looking at community health, there is only 19. So with that, that tells the story of how attractive is community nursing actually in attracting nurses to be uh, to move towards advanced practices and to be actually working in community uh, in the community serving community dwelling elders. So with this, I wanted to actually set the note, set the scene for our panelist discussion, which will be uh, will be now. Yeah. So I'll, I'll Thank you. Thank you, Yo Yong. Let me have a seat. Okay, so now I'd like to invite the rest of our panelists up. To start with, we have our keynote speaker, Professor Torres, uh, Cortez, sorry. And next, we'll have Miss Pauline Ko, Chief Nurse from Changi General Hospital. And then we'll have Associate Professor Chao Yao Ling, Director of Students Affairs, Alice Lee Centre for Nursing Studies, Yong Lo Lin School of Medicine, NUS. Sister Geraldine Tan, Executive Director of St. Joseph's Home. Ms. Pei Jin Yu, Advanced Practice Nurse, Nurse Educator of South Foundation. And Yo Hyung will be moderating this session. I'll leave the stage to you. Uh, the audience will get, get the chance to actually ask questions, but maybe now let me warm up the panelists first by maybe just asking uh, some uh, um, questions. Maybe uh, we, we have been talking a lot uh, this morning on actually uh, educations and training of the nurse, of the uh, community Geron nurse. And then maybe I'll just maybe ask the panelists, because Prof has already shared a lot on the content itself, but maybe uh, in the perspective of, uh, maybe I'll start with uh, uh, um, maybe Pauline, you know, coming from the acute hospital side, and being the chief nurse of uh, uh, acute hospital, in terms of moving community drawn nurse into the community, what do you think are some of the uh, 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 ingredients for a uh, effective community nurse? You know, from the acute setting to come into the community, maybe you would like to uh, share with us. And we go around to the panels, panelists to actually have a have their own thinking about what are the e effective ingredients to be an effective. Geronist, Committee Geron. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. In fact, I see quite a number of familiar uh, faces here. So this morning as we were starting out, we say actually, um, you know, um, Prof Chow and myself, we were talking, say the experts are out in the audience. Yeah, okay. But um, I think nevertheless, I will share my experience. I come, I must say that I'm not born out in, from the community uh, nursing uh, side. I'm actually from the acute care side. And then now as the uh, CN of uh, Changi General Hospital, uh, we are given this opportunity to uh, develop this uh, cluster-led uh, community nursing uh, pilot uh, uh, initiative. So this is really a milestone in uh, nursing uh, profession uh, development. And I hope that everyone can recognize that this is a milestone uh, happening. 
and we need to be um, uh, proud and happy that we are given this uh, trust and confidence to do this. And I think MOH also recognised that there is really now a need uh, for nursing to uh, move into the community and to take the lead. Yeah, and therefore, the three healthcare clusters are all uh, tasked to now uh, develop this community nursing model. And we are in it, in this whole thing together. So as much as we set the uh, structure, the system to allow this to happen, I think the content building, the capability building, all that still have to come from the nurses who are practicing out there. And we have to learn from each other. And I must say, uh, in the beginning when we first started, and that was like uh, two, three years ago when really uh, actively working on this, we started off with uh, sending acute care nurses into the community. And then we were hit by a few, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, hit with some challenges. And I think we also learned uh, through the process. Because I think our initial group of uh, acute care nurses, when they went out, I think we, we started with uh, working with the nursing homes. Yeah, and hoping that, you know, we can work with the, the nursing homes to uh, help build capability. Then our team of nurses go out and I think just very uh, innocently, unknowingly, bringing the acute care set of uh, standards uh, to one, the nursing homes to uh, also achieve that standards. But I think we, were, we really learned a big lesson here. And I must admit that uh, that was really a, a good lesson. Uh, it is not directly uh, transferable. And we cannot expect that uh, out in the community, you're going to uh, do the same as in the acute uh, setting because the setting is entirely different. The uh, focus of care is also entirely different. And the context, the, the uh, patients that you are working with, is entirely different and therefore I think this is really a big step for us to learn and I think uh, over the two years uh, yes we have um, adjusted and and also um, work you know to, to learn also from the community uh, um, uh, leaders out there to um, you know adjust the way we work together yeah and it has now come up to be uh, uh, very good yeah okay so, uh, so in that way, I would say uh, acute care sector does provide a strong foundation, but once the nurse go, go out, uh, it does require a lot of uh, adjustment. I think always put ourselves as in the position of the patient or the family members. What sort of care would you like? And uh, one thing that I learned is that out in the community, sometimes while we are very, very, uh, you know, very... Uh, you know, tar focus on getting the clinical outcomes uh, 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 being achieved, but sometimes that's not the most important uh, to the person, to the to the senior person out there. Yeah, uh, in fact, the social part, the other um, uh, personal kind of aspirations, needs actually all come into play, and I think the nurse uh, needs to uh, understand that and how to uh, put all this in together in order to derive a meaningful, uh, person-centric care that Prof. Uh, Tara talks about. Uh, it has to be really person-centric. It is not what we want to achieve in the ac uh, acute sector where we want them to be you know, cured of or, or treated of uh, disease. I think that's not the uh, ultimate goal. So all of us need to understand that. Yeah. Okay, so I can go on and on and talk, uh, but I think I, I leave it to the other panelists to... Uh, just also comment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, maybe I'll direct the question to the practitioner first before we talk, talk about the training from Prof. Uh, Charles. So maybe Jin Yu, would you like to also share a little bit like what are the, 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 the active ingredients you think is you new know, for an effective community Jaron, because you have been actually from acute site and now you're in community. So what are some of your thoughts, you know, to this? Um, okay, what I will be sharing will be my personal experience. Um, when, I mean, previously I worked in uh, acute hospital, so um, as a specialist nurse, I actually see patients with chronic disease, mainly diabetes, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. So the, diff the key difference is 
when I work in a acute care setting and in a specialist clinic, it is actually very disease focused, okay, and very evidence based driven. But when I step out of the acute hospital, moving in the community, it is a rather steep learning curve because I realize that things are not just about disease. I have um, the decision making become more complex because it's no longer just about evidence. So we have to, the, the, it's a lot of factors that affect the decision. So mainly, of course, evidence based versus person centeredness. That is already a difficult thing. Patient safety versus patient's autonomy. I mean, there's another whole different set of dimension, you know. So, because why all these considerations come about is more on moving forward to being um, person-centered, you know. And, and, you know, just to highlight on some things shared by uh, uh, Prof Tara, a lot of things that hit on me is on the social determinants. So, a lot of time, you know, being in hospital, we may not actually take that much into consideration, you know. What hap whatever happened during that setting, encounter with the patient, ends there. There may not necessarily be a like uh, ownership because next next time I may not see this patient again. You know, I may only see you three months later. Whether you can come for my appointment or not, I really don't know how you come. Uh. You know, you, you come here by bus or somebody send you. Usually, sometimes this may not be the thing that will cross my mind until I come to committee. All these are the meticulous, small, small little thing that matters a lot. So, um, so what I feel that is the ownership. You know, working in committee. You need to have the ownership to feel that you own this case and you need to follow through. And owning this case is maybe it's like, you know, your term is a nursing leadership, you know. And it's a lot of coordination and engaging different stakeholders at different times. You know, you have different stakeholders who will come in more prominent at different times, but the most prominent person will always have to be the patient and of course they are family caregivers, you know, um, and you know, the social workers and then um, the medical uh, team uh, advice as well. So all these people, they will come in at different phases, but it is happening all the time, you know, just the, the depth and how much of the engagement. So with this, you know, I also realized there's a lot of um, communication skills that are involved. You know, it's not so easy, you talk to the patient and then that's it, no? Sometimes you still need to talk to the caregiver to get the buy-in. You know, so there's a lot of things that's involved if we want certain things to carry out. So before I want my nursing, so-called nursing captain to come through, I need to consider has the social aspect been settled or not. So it's not so straightforward. So and, and um, I would say the care is actually more holistic because we really need to look at the person as a whole. It's not just the disease, not just the HbA1c and then the BP treat to target. So it's really much more than that. Yeah. Then maybe uh, uh, Sister Geraldine, you want to add to? Uh I always believe that community is where the person wants to be. I can have a nice home, but I can house a person, but not house the heart. The heart is where an older person is have this perception. Hello. We always have this misconception that if the person is alone, they cannot be nursed at home. Because a home for a person who is alone is a family. And the family is their neighbors or caregivers. So they can still be a, they can still stay at home even though they are without a family where they want to age in place. And I feel that as, um, as nurses, we're running a home or running community service, we have to be very, very, very alert to where the heart is for an older person. And I always have this dream that the nursing home can be a temporary place and not the last resort. A temporary place that way they can be nourished, they can be stronger at the longer term, and move back to where they are. So that is maybe the future. I'm not so sure, but that is always this dream, that it can be temporary. And all admissions to the home now, we say, if you have a chance to move back, 
when will be that chance? She said, maybe sister, another two years, I can move back. There is that hope that they are going to be at home. So when there is a hope, there is life. And where there's life, you can energize them to find me fulfillment. And I, all the whole concept of this aging and older people, or the way you call them, what we are trying to do is actually to, to let them end life peacefully, not in pieces. To, to really die in peace, but not in pieces. So that is, should be our own tagline. How can we support? And I said, if there should be a chance for community engagement and all this, where there is a place where seamlessly from community, they just need that care and come to a nursing home for a period of six weeks or ten weeks without going through all those systems. Maybe it works. Possible. Through our own fundings or whatever. Maybe it can give the more security to the person. Because the person always think that even if I go to a community hospital, I don't think I'm coming back. Because that is their fear. But if you give them, this is temporarily and you will go home later on. Come for weekdays and go back for weekends. I think things like that will be, you will not be so frightening to age in Singapore. Thank you. Then what about Prof, from the curriculum and development uh, of uh, training of actually nursing, and nurses is concerned, um, you know, how, how to boost up this piece of the, not just the theoretical, but also, you know, uh, the attitudes, you know, com to be competent, you know, knowledge, skills and attitudes. So, so how, to, how to craft up such kind of curriculum that is so, uh, that it is practical and it's effective? Thank you. Uh, maybe allow me to have a few minutes of personal share time. Uh, this morning, I was discussing with Pauline, saw so some of my ex-students. Um, so they, are already, they were from my advanced deep gerontology, almost some of them 20 years ago. And uh, I can see that they are really flourishing. And then they're, they're, they are leaders in their own field. And I um, just say that I'm very happy, I'm very proud of it. So keep it up. Yeah? So, because I will be the recipient sometime. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, as the Prof mentioned early on, integration is very difficult in terms of the curriculum. So allow me to uh, say that um, we are keep revising our curriculum to uh, put emphasis in the community and geriatrics. Uh, in the past, we do have a standalone module on uh, health and wellness in aging, yeah? because we believe that it should be a continuum. So develop from the health perspective and then go on to the chronic diseases. We also have a module on community nursing. But I have to admit that it was not well developed in the sense that it's very theoretical. Yeah. So it's only the last year or so, uh, we realized that we must uh, relate that to practice. So at this point, I must thank my colleagues from the different hospitals that allow our student, year three, to spend one day to tag along with your home nurse uh, to observe how the home nurse, uh, home nursing, the home nurse sort of perform in the community. And they come back, to, to, they write a patient account, uh, observation, reflection, and I can tell you, they learn a lot. And they really appreciate it because uh, majority of the time, their clinical is in the hospital. Yeah, uh, although we send them out in the community, but it's very haphazard. But this time we make it much more structured. And the really student appreciate that, yeah, you know, uh, nursing uh, patient is not just about uh, in the hospital. You really observe the home situation environment, as Polly mentioned and all of the other speakers, uh, taking into uh, consideration of the environment, you know, carers, the financial issues, and things like that. So they really appreciate holistic care from that experience. So we will continue to, for this uh, pedagogy, and we hope that our colleagues in the clinical will support us as well. So uh, just coming back very uh, uh, briefly about how do we integrate uh, community and gerontology in our undergrad program now, rather than the standalone. Uh, because 
how we, we need to, um, first of all, decide what value system we want to develop our students. In other words, at the end of the three years, what is it we are hoping that what do we develop in our student, the value system and all that. So then we work backward. So value, like for example, if we consider value the person as a person, whoever they are, then in year one, we focus on respect for person. So we look at the theory of respect, we also look and we also engineered the students first year to work together so that they will um, respect each other, teamwork, you know, and also at the same time, as Prof mentioned earlier on the interprofessional education, we are fortunate in NUS that we have medicine, we have nursing, pharmacy, social work, uh, so, and also uh, dental and all that. So we deliberately engineer them, the student, in the first year to work together so that from the very basic, they learn to communicate each other. Then so that later on, uh, in year three, we also have a pedagogy where we get these groups, uh, see more senior students together to look at uh, discharge plan. So how they communicate each other and all that. So communication, respect, so we're skyfolding it year one, year two, and year three. So uh, earlier I mentioned about communication. Maybe in the first year we look at uh, communication, you know, daily thing. But when you come to year three, they have more experience in the clinical area. So at the same time, they also come across more conflicting situations, like carers, you know, coming back to about palliative care, coming back to about NLI care. They come across a, a situation where um, patients don't want treatment. And yet, the, the, the students, usually caregivers, are trained to sort of aggressive treatment and all that. So how to reconcile that conflict and all that? So these are some of the examples uh, how we develop our curriculum. I hope I answer your questions. Yeah, thank you for sharing. So uh, I think um, uh, maybe let me give the audience a chance. Do you have any questions for the panelists here? Okay, so we will take one question first. Yeah. Would well, like to identify yourself and then what is your questions? Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, good morning. I'm Hui Ling from NHG Polyclinics and from the primary care training department. Uh, so this question, I'd like to consult uh, Prof Tara. Uh, the, because in US, uh, it's also uh, similar to Singapore. It's a melting pot society. And in Singapore nowadays, we can see there are many uh, senior persons uh, they are actually followed their family members, especially children, and settled down in Singapore. For example, they may be from China, the seniors may be from China, or different parts uh, of India, or even from Myanmar. And uh, the, the thing which is um, not highlighting, especially in local contexts, is um, they have access issues to the healthcare because of language barrier. Yeah, so, uh, and so uh, how do we develop the kind of cultural competency beyond the cultural awareness level of our nurses. And the other thing is um, during my gerontology course, um, there's a professor from Hawaii Uni University. He shared that another challenge that US is facing is about the older adults in the LGBT community. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to consult Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, diversity, I, 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 the, your umbrella question is diversity. Um, cultural diversity, gender diversity, uh, um, sexual diversity, all of those things can, are, are within that question. Uh, let me take the cultural, the, the aging um, person first in terms of a different, from different countries and how do we deal with that. I, I mean, one of the things that we do use heavily in the US are translation services. We have, uh, you know, you can dial on a telephone and get translation services so that you can have somebody in like 180 languages address um, somebody in their particular language. And that is a wonderful service to have. So that is one of the ways we deal with it. The other way we deal with it is really, again, utilizing the family because usually someone in the family is bilingual or trilingual. So we utilize people within the family heavily 
to interpret, to reinforce, to teach, and to support uh, the older person who does not speak English. So those are really the ways in which we handle the um, language piece. Uh, and, and culturally, again, I, to me, it's always about the community. So if they are from a Bangladesh community, you know, how do, what are the values of that Bangladesh community that are important to them? And how do they, what, when, they, when they're making up the plan of care, I've got to remember that the cultural differences from Bangladesh to my culture could be very different and I need to respect that. So it's respect of those cultural values. The LGBTQ is, has become a big issue. We had a, a session yesterday afternoon when I brought this up. And uh, for us in the United States, you know, we had a major HIV um, epidemic back in the 80s and uh, the retroviral therapy came into place. What we're finding is that as the uh, population that has, um, that has AIDS or HIV and AIDS, particularly those who have been maintained on the anti antiviral um, uh, uh, treatment, have, they age earlier. So people who are 50, uh, physiologically and sometimes cognitively look like someone who's 65 or 70. The onset of cardiac disease is much more pre uh, prevalent in 50 to 55 year olds, more, more like what you would see in someone who has not been on that medication during their 70s, during their seventh decade. So it is, uh, so what we're seeing then is these people need more support services. Many of them are going into long-term care, long uh, nursing homes, because they don't have family. They don't have a support system. There's a stigma. So we are, we, uh, we are doing a lot of education. In fact, um, the Hartford Institute is just, we've, we've, uh, we're working with um, a long, developing long-term care cur curriculum modules, and one of them is on, we call it diversity, but the core of it is uh, how, how do you respect, how do you understand the values of people that are different than you and, um, and the need to care for people in a meaningful manner. So uh, maybe I'll come back to the panelists with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with um, the other part of the, uh, because just now we talk about the nurse, the practitioner. Then if, if we want to see nursing you know, going forward, definitely we're also looking towards nursing leaders. You know, nursing leaders, how the nursing leaders is going to drive the community nurses forward and, and uh, to attract nurses to the community. So maybe um, uh, I'll pass the mic to actually ask Prof about maybe, uh, because I read an article from Prof there about leadership, which is very interesting, then uh, maybe you can share some light on actually some messages to our nursing leaders here because uh, there are a lot of geron-trained nurses here and then they will be the future nurses. So what are some of the things that you feel that it is important you know, for them to actually um, uh, build this capability up so that they can drive uh, committee nursing forward? Uh, <coughs> thank you. I, 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 Fong shared with me the other day this, this article that, that uh, was an interview with me in, in Nurse Leader and I'd kind of forgotten some of the things that I had, I had said. Uh, but I think re just reflecting on it, it it's, it's all about a core. It's, it's a core of, of again, I, I say to you, I said it before, but it's, leadership is not how to do. It's not you know, that I'm more skilled than somebody else. It, it's about how to be, who you are inside. And I, I think your values always, um, values that drive leaders, I think, drive, drive leadership and leaders. I, I think one of the most important things that always remember when you're working with a team, when you're working with patients, when you're working with ever, with anybody, there's never an I, 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 I. It's always about we. We did this. I, I, the ver I call it the vertical pronoun, the I, the vertical pronoun. It has no place in leadership. You don't do anything by yourself. It's all about everybody who helps you get to where you are. I've always thought, of, I always surround myself with bright people and then I look great. But it's the people that are around me that make the difference. It's not about me. So if, and I particularly look for people who have skill sets that I don't have. You know, there are some things that I'm good at. There are many things that I'm not good at. I'm not a, I am not a T crosser and I daughter. I'm not, I'm not a, a I, I kind of like the big vision, I like to deal with that. I know that I'm not someone who wants to 
get down to the grassroots with something. I need people around me who do that kind of work. So you complement yourself with people who have a different skill set. If everybody looked just like me, you know, it's, it's, we're not going to have, we're not going to do anything. So people with a different skill set than I have, and um, and I always remember that I'm only as good as they are. I, I'm, I'm uh, that we are we are together as we move forward. My my staff at the institute, we have a small staff. We have eight of us, um, and they are. I've got unique skills, wonderful people. But it's really growing that team and having a constant mutual respect and an opportunity to provide feedback that I listen to. It's important to listen. And every so often, I even for, I, I forget, you know, that I'm, they, they say something and, you know, maybe your team says something to you and, and ooh, you think, uh, no, I didn't, I'm, that's not, I didn't mean that. I didn't, I didn't say that. You know, perception is 99% of the truth. So even if it's not what you meant to portray, their perception of what a situation was is what the situation was for them. And you may have said something, done something, did something that, that, is, um, that they perceived in a certain way. And you need to be open to criticism, open to, um, to ideas, open to different ways of thinking. And particularly when you think open to different ways of thinking, you know, I've been around a while. Uh, some of the young people coming up around me have very different perceptions than I have. It's important that if I'm going to remain relevant, I need to be open to different perceptions, different values, different ideas about how to do things. Because the world is changing around me, and unless I change with it, I become the dinosaur and no longer relevant. So I think it's open communication. It certainly is a lot about trust and integrity. I, I talked this morning about not, never saying I know when you don't know, never guessing, never second guessing. Be honest, be honest, because if you're not honest, you lose trust from your team and you're not going to be able to lead them in a meaningful manner. Um, the other things that I, I feel are important are inclusivity, um, community, building, uh, being inclusive of, of everybody around me. And I'm going to take that beyond um, just your team or your, your, your patients. But I'll talk a little bit about professional development and the importance of building those, those being inclusive of a network that is outside, sometimes outside of your comfort zone. Uh, you know, as nurses, we sometimes are very, we're somewhat narrow. We get into um, our, our circle as nurses. And if your circle is only nurses, you're limiting the breadth and depth of who you are and what you can become. I've always believed that my networks need to be broad and wide in areas that aren't really nursing. So I have networks in business. I have networks in, in policy. I have networks in politics. I have um, uh, networks in other professional groups, social work. I, I mean, I'm called on by one of the national social work groups, they call on me to sit at the table to be part of them. In Washington, I sit on an advisory committee for primary care training in medicine and dentistry. I'm the only nurse at the table. We're not talking about nursing, but you know what? It's important that nursing be represented when we're talking about primary care training in medicine and dentistry. So I'm delighted to have a seat at that table so that I can bring in the voice of nurses. But I didn't get there by just raising my hand, you get there by building those networks. Always reach outside of your comfort zone. Don't be afraid. When you, when you become silent, you're not, you're not going to advance yourself, but more importantly, you're not going to advance your profession and you're not going to advance the health care of all of the population that we all care about. You need to be a powerful voice at the table. You need to sit up and speak. You need to make your own voice heard and, and be part of the, the journey, be part of the story, not just a side, a side reader, but be part of developing the story of healthcare going forward. Is that, did I cover what you wanted to? <laughs> Yeah, I, I certainly agree with uh, Prof. Tara, and you like covered almost everything. <laughs> okay, perhaps maybe I I share from uh, from the perspective of some of the current work that we are currently doing 
in terms of building a nursing leadership to meet this new, you know, new need of uh, uh, healthcare needs. So we know that we have to go beyond uh, hospital to a community. We have to go beyond health, healthcare treatment to health. These are the three beyond set. You know, these are the two of the three beyond set uh, MOH has uh, mentioned. Yeah. So as a nursing fraternity, I think we came together under the leadership of um, CNO's office uh, to look at then uh, going forward, then what would be some of the uh, leadership uh, qualities that's required. And uh, we have worked with uh, MOHH as well. So uh, I think some of you, especially the, the senior nursing leaders here, you would have been invited to participate in a focus group uh, uh, session last year by MOHH to really identify what are some of the uh, leadership qualities that's required. And I'm very happy to say that they have already consolidated all those uh, survey findings because they conducted uh, multiple sessions uh, really look, uh, talking to many uh, nursing leaders, uh, in, including Allied Health as well, and consulted uh, the medical team as well. And they've come up with a, a document, uh, a recommendation. If I, I don't know whether it is available uh, in their website or whatever. It is called the uh, MOHH uh, One Healthcare Leadership Framework. So that framework is uh, very comprehensive. It talks about, I'm actually reading from here. If anyone wants a copy, I, I, I will ask them whether I can share. But I think it is good if eventually every nurse gets a copy. It talks about the values uh, required for the new uh, uh, you know, a nursing leader, such as compassion, humility, uh, integrity, that we have, I think all of us in some way or another talk about and some personal uh, qualities such as uh, learning agility. I think learning is uh, never, uh, uh, there's no ending point. We always will be uh, learning and we need to be adjust, you know, uh, adaptable and agile in this whole uh, learning journey. And the other important uh, quality will be resilience. I think in whatever we do, uh, you are bound to uh, face with challenges and therefore being resilient it is a, a, a good quality to help us um, you know, sustain the work that we need to do. And of course, uh, EQ is also important. Yeah. Then on the outer uh, rim of, the, of it, uh, which I think a lot of it has already been uh, covered by uh, Prof Tara, she mentioned about collective leadership. So it is not I being the expert, I'm the best, I'm the leader and everyone listens to me. No, I think it is about Every nurse, everyone is a leader and that collective leadership is you know, the way forward and it is going to be a more powerful than individual uh, leadership. Encourages communication, uh, brave decision making, holistic uh, systems thinking, visionary leadership, driving transformation, developing others and collaborative uh, working. Yeah. So this in a nutshell uh, sums up you know, what, what's uh, the leadership uh, um, quality uh, that's required. Then, how then do we then take such uh, big statements out into practice? So using this framework as a guide, I think MOHH, uh, especially uh, CNO's office, they have also uh, worked out on some leadership uh, training programs. So uh, we're going to launch this uh, Singapore Nurse Leader Program, we call it SNLP. Uh, that it is that's going to come up uh, February next year. So in that uh, leadership, the the middle managers such as the nurse managers, nurse clinicians, nurse educators will be identified by your respective uh, uh, HODs to uh, attend this MOHH uh, leadership uh, training. And this whole framework will be uh, uh, adopted. You know, will be used as a guide to guide that development of the program. But one interesting thing about this program is there will be a, a one-month clinical attachment to three community partners out there. So uh, we will have to identify three that we think that will be useful for our leaders. So whether it is in a com house or out in a home care uh, setting or maybe also in a very uh, integrated hub type of a, a setting. Like for example, uh, if you have experienced the OTH hub or the Kampong Ameriti uh, integrated hub, that's also a very good place uh, to, to learn about how it is like to work in the community. So in this whole program, 
within that one month, the person who is attending this program will be going to these three community uh, partners attachment. And uh, there will be support given to these uh, community partners uh, to, you know, for this participant to learn from them. So hopefully with that knowledge, then if they bring it back to the hospital or if they are working in the community, that will help to strengthen uh, their overall perspectives. It is helping the individual to gain a broader perspective of the whole healthcare ecosystem. So no longer just acute sector uh, uh, centric, but it is a larger healthcare uh, ecosystem. So that's one uh, program that's coming up. The other one, which was launched last year, is the Community Nursing uh, Scholarships. How many of you have heard of it? It is actually launched already. MOH has actually rolled out this Community Nursing Scholarship. And I think last year they have awarded, I think, four scholarships to, to new uh, students who are coming on board to join nursing. So at the start, uh, as they are joining diploma program or degree program, if they indicate and they are assessed to be suitable for community nursing, uh, they will be given this scholarship. And during the three, four years of study, uh, this whole learning will be incorporated. And then when they graduate, uh, the first year they will spend the first six months in the acute setting, then the subsequent six months will be out in the community. And then after that, they will go out to uh, work in the community uh, setting. And hopefully, these will become future nursing leaders uh, for, for us, you know, to help shape community nursing out there. Yeah, so these are two of the two, uh, two key initiatives that has already been uh, uh, kind of decided that it will be implemented. Yeah. So, uh, I think um, I, I will just sum up because Time is up. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So uh, maybe uh, during the uh, very short discussion, there's actually never enough time that uh, to discuss about actually uh, how to train committee general nurses and what are the uh, the the attitudes you know uh, to actually bring along to actually nurture this person into nursing leaderships. And as Pauline also have shared that you know a lot of programs uh, ministries is up. You know, to actually attract more nurses, more nursing leaders, and uh, Prof has actually shared on some of the values, you know, of nursing leaderships and our practitioners, and actually I can mean like Prof also have actually shared about a touch a little bit into actually uh, 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 nursing knowledge and also some of the attributes, you know, that we would like to see in the committee nurses and. Um, all these attributes are actually invaluable and uh, at the end of the day, uh, whether we attract um, the person with the right heart to come into community, to re really want to actually uh, love older person and serve older person you know, to the best they can and go the extra miles. And this we will, I think each and every one of us is a nurse leader by our own actions and by our own uh, 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 um, uh, sharing. So all of us are ambassador. So be nice to each other and then uh, we actually work together from the community, feedback to the you know, uh, restructure hospital and so that with humility we can learn from each other to actually move forward uh, better care for our community dwelling elders. Yeah, I'll pass the mic back to uh, Jasmine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you indeed to all our panellists for that intriguing discussion. And indeed, time is uh, never enough. And the call to nurse leadership is never louder than now. <laughs> okay, so at this point, we would like to invite Kim Chu up to present tokens of appreciation to our um, panellists. Okay, uh, to our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Cortez. Ms. Pauline Ko. <laughs> Associate Professor Chao Yao Ling. <laughs> Sister Geraldine Tan. Can we invite the panel for a photo together? 
Right, ladies and gentlemen, so with that, we have come to the close of our two-day symposium. So on behalf of Sound Foundation, once again, thank you for taking time out. Especially thank you to our uh, keynote speaker, Professor Torres, and our panelists. So let's answer the call to nurse leadership. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, and have a good afternoon, I think.